Hello, hello to you all. Welcome to webinar Wednesday from Fuse. Um, my name is Sascha Arweiler. Um, I'm the Fuse um, Communications Director um, and I'm your host for today's uh, Fuse webinar. Um, the session will be recorded as usual and we will post um, the um, recording on our Fuse website later. Uh, we have an exciting to, uh, agenda today. Um, which uh, I present right now on the screen. Um, so you, uh, before we start into the actual agenda, I will um, give a brief update uh, from the FUSE Board of Directors. Um, and then we will uh, transfer to Michael Harris, our uh, EU Connect Chair, who will give you some exciting updates about the uh, upcoming EU Connect. Um, we will then pass over to um, Tim Williams um, from UCB, who will present um, on linked data for clinical trials. Um, and uh, Peter and Amy will then take over and talk about a CDISC workshop. And we will end um, our webinar with a visualization of these uh, group related differences, um, which is an exciting uh, project update, um, a new project launch, uh, which will pre be presented by Ellen Brown and uh, Phil Drew. Um, so I would like to welcome all speakers and uh, thanks for so, uh, supporting uh, FUSE here. Um, but without further ado, I would like to um, share with you some um, updates here we want to give you from uh, the FUSE board. Um, Michael Harris will give you some more detailed updates uh, later about the FUSE uh, Uconnect. Uh, but I just want to let you know that there are still rooms available uh, at a discounted race at the uh, Maritime Hotel. Uh, so please, if, if you haven't booked uh, yet, um, so um, please hurry up because uh, rooms are um, filling quickly. Uh, we also have, um, you might have seen uh, the announcement that we had again about 240 papers submitted to our call for paper system for the upcoming Fuse Connect in the US. Uh, so and this is really exciting um, because we it is less than half a year ago that we um, had our inaugural uh, US conference in Raleigh and the Baltimore conferences um, will take place uh, in February. And uh, we are very happy that the committee is right now working again on a very exciting agenda. Uh, we have confirmed keynote speakers, um, uh, confirmed already. And uh, please be aware that the early bird uh, registration will close uh, November 2nd. Um, we also have some upcoming single day events. Uh, so there is a single day event uh, upcoming on uh, the October 21st in Warsaw. We have an upcoming SD in uh, Chennai in India. Um, and in November, there will be also some upcoming SDEs in South Africa and in China. Uh, so as you know, um, single day events are free for all FUSE members and uh, they are considered as uh, of high, uh, to be uh, as of high value. So please um, register in time to, to reserve your seat. Um, then there we, we will also have some updates about uh, the new projects, uh, as I mentioned already. Um, but please um, take a look at um, some uh, deliverables which would require your review. Uh, so there, if you want to help shaping the industry and advancing uh, the industry, um, there are very interesting uh, uh, working group deliverables out there uh, on optimizing the use of data standards, especially. So um, if you want to uh, give input into the data reviewers guide in XML or uh, define XML 2.0, and, and uh, which includes uh, style sheet recommendations or um, the, um, the CSDRG completion guidelines, uh, which is a clinical SDRG um, in version 1.3, um, if you want to give input, uh, so you will find um, the contact details and uh, the actual deliverables on our FUSE website as well. Um, so last but not least, I want to highlight again that the autumn FUSE news uh, were published on September 1st. You will find them on our FUSE website. We are working on some uh, new publication method uh, to get the FUSE newsletter to you in a um, in a better format than PDF, also, which will be implemented uh, with a FUSE um, news in, in, uh, for the winter edition. Um, 
as usual, you can follow views on uh, various social media platforms um, on Twitter, Facebook, or um, LinkedIn, and also YouTube, uh, where we will we'll also post uh, the recording of this video. Um, and of course, there will be an upcoming uh, Fuse monthly mailing um, out on uh, October 1st. That's it uh, from my side, um, but let me also mention that uh, we will have an upcoming webinar Wednesday on October uh, 24th, and the topic will be confirmed shortly. So I would like to hand over now to, um, to Michael Harris, who is our uh, EU Connect uh, co-chair. Um, you please uh, be aware that all um, phone lines are muted, uh, So, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free to post them in the chat box and uh, we will try to answer if we still have time um, at the end of the webinar. So over to you, Michael. Michael, you're talking on mute if you talk. Yep, sorry about that. Thank you, Sasha. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, so as Sasha said, um, my name is Michael Harris, and I am going to. I am the co-chair of the eConnect 2018. I'm here on on behalf of Katja, who's on holiday, so she's just asked me to come and uh, say a few things about the conference. So what I'm just going to do is we're going to have a look at Frankfurt, um, sort of go through things to do and trying in Frankfurt, and then talk about the conference itself and um, yeah and, and just finish up and pass over to the next presenter so just something just to point out there are 39 days to go and myself and Katja are really looking forward to this event so as you can see from the the image um, Frankfurt looks like a beautiful city um, it's officially known as Frankfurt and Maine and it's known as the financial capital of Germany, has fantastic skylines and uh, sort of skyscrapers, vivid river or vivid views of the river and countless bridges. There's lots to do in this uh, city, which is over 2000 years old, um, such as the visit in the opera house or the zoo. There's just many things and bars and clubs. So lovely things to sort of uh, view and visit outside of the conference. So just up on the screen at the moment, um, I've got a few things to do. So again, I'm just highlighting this because as you all know from previous conferences, you know, time really flies when, you, when you're there and it's it's very, it's very intense um, experience. And uh, so yeah, just highlighting the things to try and visit. So you don't want to come away from there thinking, oh, I wish I'd seen this or that. So definitely visit the old town and things to do in the center, such as visiting the main tower or Gethy House or the Skyline Plaza. Things to try, I don't know if you're aware, but um, Frankfurt is known for its green sauce. So definitely, if anything, please ensure that you try this, this delicacy, this, this dish. And also there is um, this, this beverage called apple wine, um, which is served in this peculiar shaped um, jug. And we see this everywhere. So definitely things to try. Now onto the conference itself. Um, as I said, um, we're in a beautiful city and this venue um, really is um, amazing. So Fuse really have excelled themselves with this. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of images of, of what to expect. Um, it's gonna be light, it's airy, it's, it's won awards. It really is the perfect space for a, a brilliant conference. So, the conference this year, it's the theme is future forward. So what can we expect? We have, well, as we all know, our standard lab landscape, which is led by CDIS, will be extended by Fahir and technologies are evolving. And in addition to classical data warehouses and metadata repositories, there's going to be more and more linked data solutions. So we're keen to see how we can work how we can improve our work and, and how we do things through machine learning and other intelligent solutions, there are new visualizations, uh, interactive displays, all which give us a greater insight into the data. So, you know, how will this affect our jobs? 
in what we do, that the landscapes are continually changing. There are so many possibilities. Um, but as you all know, we work within this regulated environment. So please come along and share your experiences and thoughts and uh, see how we can navigate our way to the future. So up on the screen, you can see um, a few things that I've highlighted. So we've got over 15, 15 streams. So that includes uh, application development, analytics and statistics, code and tips, you know, the, the list goes on. Um, and we do have some new ones this year, which I will go on and talk about. We have over 140 presentations and 30 posters. And as of last count, there were um, 590 attendees so we're doing really really well and we currently have 44 exhibitors and just as a side just to make you aware really something maybe people don't give much thought as who or what goes into making these things happen so you know, there are approximately 200 people involved in making this happen you know so we've got the committee members you know the back office there are many sort of supporters in addition to this and then clearly we have the people presenting and then obviously we had the delegates and all together um, we make for these exciting conferences year after year. Just to make you aware the agenda is available on the FUSE website and um, so we'll kick off on the, the Sunday there will be the usual kind of opportunities to sort of meet um, so it'll be the, the, the stream and co-chair meeting, the speakers meeting, as well as registration. And then we'll have the poster session. And then starting on the Monday through to Wednesday, it's sort of full steam ahead. Um, just to make you aware, on Monday, um, there'll be the gala dinner. So what's new for 2018? So as you can see on the screen, I've, I've highlighted um, the new streams, but I'm only going to focus on a couple of those. Um, we're going to have analytical risk-based monitoring and machine learning. Those are two things that um, seem to have uh, got everyone's attention this year. So analytical risk-based mon monitoring is going to be with Shafi and Sina, and machine learning is going to be with Ian and Assad. We also have um, this year, oops, we also have um, lecture sessions which will last the duration of an hour and one of the ones that i'm going to feature is the one from dr lillian rosario from the fda so this these sessions will give us an opportunity they'll be an hour in duration to um, delve into topics in a bit more detail so that's going to be an exciting additions for this year we're also um due to feedback we're actually going to have an additional poster session so we'll have the main post session on the Sunday evening and then on Tuesday at lunchtime there'll be a kind of like a, a mop-up session so it'll be a cut down version but it will give everyone an opportunity to take another look at the posters to um, you know hopefully they have any questions speak to the post presenters etc so hopefully that will be rewarding for both both the author and for the delegates we're going to have our hands-on workshops. This year we're going to be looking at TFL generation with R, linked data and machine learning. Um, so please note you the registration has opened and um, it's on a first come first um, first come served first come first base serve basis so um, please um, if you're interested um, please sign up now. And finally we're going to have our leadership session where we're going to see and discuss the challenges that we face of the future. So how do we um, how do we cope with the increasing workforce in our industry? How are we impacted and how do we deal with legislation changes? And we're also going to talk about blockchain. We have three exciting keynotes, Kurt Bourne, Luke Simon, and Emma Lawton. Um, Emma Lawton, is actually um, a Parkinson's disease um, sufferer. So she's going to talk about her experiences as, as well as her, her life. And so that's, you know, we're going to begin it from the patient perspective. So um, Sasha touched on this earlier, um, just to say there are rooms available at the hotel. 
So um, again, please sign up. And just to make you aware, there are a couple of exhibitor um, spaces um, available too, if you're interested. So with that, I will hand over to Tim. Thank you very much, Michael. And today I am going to talk to you about, um, no, skipping ahead to a data problem. We don't want to talk about that right away. We want to talk about an overview of the clinical trials, link data for clinical trials and interactive hands-on workshop. And this will occur on the Monday of the conference. And it lasts about two hours. We have had similar workshops in the past about link data, but this one is entirely retooled for EU Connect 18, and we're really excited about it. It streamlines a lot of the activities, makes them a lot more interactive and fun along the way. Now, uh, I've seen the screen already a little bit here. Data problems, well, you might be aware of a few in pharma that we uh, encounter. Things like data silos, legacy data systems. We also want to integrate new forms of data, data from wearables or from uh, various other sources, including text mining or healthcare provider information. We also sometimes struggle with the versions of the standards that we have, applying them to the data and being able to merge data that was structured for a particular standard. We also struggle with provenance and traceability. Where did that number come from that's in a particular table? What algorithms were applied to it? Who ran the program? Where was that data collected? And these lead to things like quality and conformance issues. We still have far too many conformance flags being tripped when we submit our data. And as a linked data nerd, I would tell you that, well, linked data with knowledge graphs can solve all of these problems and many more. So what am I talking about when I speak of linked data? Linked data means different things to different people. So specifically what I am referring to is linked data as resource description framework or RDF. And RDF takes the concept of linking things to other things using a subject linked to an object by a predicate relationship. And these are three things often referred to as a triples. The data is often stored in a triple store. And this data is interpretable by both person and machine. So what we have is, as an example here is one thing designated the subject, which is a particular study drug, and is related to a particular study through a study relationship. So we would read this as a person saying, drug one has study, study one or drug one is used in study one, for example. Another way to think about this would be that the subject is a particular identifier, which is described using a key value pair. So the key value pair would be the predicate object. In this case, drug one, study equals study one. Just another way to think about it. It's a very simple building block for data and relationships, but it can build up to very complex relationships and data graphs. So the the technology itself is not complex, but the real world is, and this allows us to represent data in a real world context. You may also hear the term knowledge graph, and this is also a bit of a contentious term. I use it to mean RDF linked data supported by an underlying ontology. And ontologies can be thought of as models of classes of things, so things and subclasses of those things, but also the relationships between them rules and restrictions that you might apply to those groups and their memberships and the data. Now, remarkably, the ontology is also in RDF. It is also made up of these subject predicate object triples and it becomes part of the data itself. Another exciting aspect of this is that you can deploy what's called a reasoner to infer new information from existing data. And we will do that as part of the workshop. Linked data might be new to some of you, but it's been around for quite a while. You may have heard of the linked open data cloud that's been around for many years. Facebook uses something called Open Graph. Google has its own knowledge graph, which is a little bit different from the knowledge graph that I just spoke about. Twitter uses FlockDB. Amazon recently re released Neptune, its linked data data store, and there are many others available. And just recently, knowledge graphs made an entry onto the Gartner hype cycle. So right here, it's as an up and comer. And if you see at the bottom, it's forecast to reach the plateau of productivity in about five to 10 years. Really could even be uh, sooner than that, I feel. So if Gartner's taking notice, this is really something that's up and coming. 
Some advantages of linked data for our industry include the fact that metadata becomes integral to the data itself. It's not in a separate metadata repository necessarily or in a spreadsheet somewhere. It's part of the instance data of the results data itself. The data has meaning and it has meaning not just to the machine, but also to the people who can look at the data. So the machine can traverse these relationships as well through query. It's easy to link to classifications and to terminology. So things like SDTM terminology, that's been available as RDF for some time now. And we can link to that and, and bring that into our data very easily. As I mentioned before, we can use ontologies and rules to infer relationships within our data and infer new information from existing data. And there's no more mapping of data. So there, we lose that concept of the foreign key table everything just becomes linked together almost by magic and having rules as part of the data means that we can create very high quality data for our submissions and there are many many other advantages as well there are several papers at eu connect that touch on linked data in some way and these are just the ones i know of there may be others uh, i just am aware of some of the content or from the title so we have a, a number of papers here that's showing an increased interest in linked data within Pharma. So I suggest you check out some of these publications and presentations as well. I will be one of your instructors. I'm a statistical systems analyst at UCB in Raleigh, North Carolina, but I'm also the FUSE project co-lead for the project clinical trials data as RDF. So we are modeling the SDTM domains and converting instance data to linked data. I'll be joined by my very talented colleague, Johannes Gulander from A3 Informatics, and he is a CDIS, matter, a CDIS subject matter expert, so I will be referring all the complex CDIS questions to him. So we will be your instructors for the session. In terms of the work, workshop activities, the first thing that you are going to do as a participant is diagram the relationships in your own personal clinical trial. So you will be assigned a study, and you will develop something that looks like this. This is actually a screenshot from the application that Johannes and I developed, where you can whiteboard these concepts, link them together uh, to form this graph of data for a small clinical study. You will then convert your diagram to RDF. Well, don't worry about that if you don't know RDF. It's just a click of a button, and we can export that diagram out to RDF. You will then use that data for querying, and visualizing, and you will explore a simple ontology that we will, will apply to your data and use a reasoner to infer some new information from your data. Then as a final step, we're going to join the data across all the studies in the workshop. So 20 some attendees with a simple query, you will pull, pull all the data together for all of those other studies into a, a data pool almost instantaneously and be able to query and reason on that data. So very exciting stuff. At the end, time permitting, we will discuss the implications for our industry, state of the art, and where we are headed with linked data. In terms of workshop requirements, absolutely no previous experience is needed. In fact, this is a very introductory webinar or workshop. We don't go into a lot of the, the tough details. It can be a very deep topic, but we keep it very introductory. Registration is limited. You must pre-register to be an active participant and have your whiteboard. And I heard just this week that we only have four spots remaining. I do encourage you to register right away. If you do miss the registration and you are interested in this topic, you can come join us as an observer. You'll just have to sit on the sidelines. But you, you will be able to see everything that we're doing, be able to learn about linked data and see what it's all about. So don't be put off if registration is full. Come join us, pencil it on a, in on your calendar, and we'd love to see you there as well. For those who pre-register and who, who will be active participants, you must attend a pre-conference webinar. And the purpose of this is to test your laptop and its ability to log into our servers. We will also give you a, some more information about the workshop and some optional background reading. And then as a final requirement, if you are an active registered participant, you must bring that laptop that you tested during the preparatory webinar to the conference because you're going to use that to log into our servers to do the activities. So that's it. I uh, look forward to meeting you all at the conference. And thank you very much. And we can hand over to the next presenter.
Um, great. Next presenter, this is Peter, Peter van Russell. I think next presenter, that would be me, right? Um, let's go. Here we go. So I get to talk about the the CDisk workshop. Um, as some of you may know, I've been uh, I've been providing the CDisk workshop for uh, for the Fuse meetings for for quite a while. But this time is a little bit different because this time I'm uh, still providing the CDisk workshop, but in a slightly different uh, role. Uh, some of you may know, since the 1st of June, I've been honored with the new position at CDisk and their new Chief Standards Officer. And uh, with me today, I also have Amy Palmer. Amy Palmer is uh, the head of standards, and both of us, we are going to be uh, bringing the CDISC workshop. Now, what you can see is um, we are very much aligning with, with, uh, with the few CSS working group. Uh, what we want to do is we want to, at the core of our workshop, we want to continue the work of the SETM ADAM implementation FAQ um, working stream over there. So Sasha already mentioned all of the good work that's being done at the few CSS working groups. We also mentioned that we need more volunteers, and this is uh, this is not different. What we are doing is we're continuing the work um, at our Fuse Connect meeting, but also hopefully we're going to make people very enthusiastic about the work that's being done. It's really good work, and uh, in an ideal world, we'll also recruit some volunteers uh, to help us out. Okay. Uh, a little bit about the background of this working group. Um, it's already since uh, since a while that this working group has been active. Um, there was a standards implementation nuances session at the March 2016 North American CSS, and also on the 2016 uh, European CSS meeting. And we surfaced various common challenges amongst SETM and ADAM implementers. We also recognize that the industry is in need of a forum of and subsequent knowledge base, FAQs, to address these challenges. So there's an active collaboration among FUSE, CDISC, and FDA. Yeah, most of us know that. Now, since I've since I've taken taken this new role with its within CDISC, um, I can tell you that CDISC also takes this, I would say, this problem, the fact that our our standards community out there, that they need help, that they need implementation help, we, we are taking this very seriously. In fact, we since this year, this is also a strategic objective of CDISC, that CDISC not only simply creates the standards, but that we are making a very active effort also to help our community implementing this. So you can really see how this, how this FUSE working group, how this initiative is very much aligned with what CDISC wants to do. That's also one of the reasons why uh, Amy Palmer quite recently has, has replaced me as a co-lead also on this working group. So we can definitely ensure that there's a good collaboration and a direct connection between CDISC and uh, this working group. Okay. Um, what about these FAQs out there? That's when a second I'm going to show you some examples of problems that we're trying to solve. Now, not all of you may be aware that there's that there's a form out there which you can visit if there's a very specific implementation question that you should have around how do I implement a certain a certain part or a certain business rule around the ZTM and ADAM. You can actually go um, to the Fuse uh, Wiki website and you can you can launch that question. Yeah. Um, it will also guide you to a uh, to a part where many of these frequently asked and answered questions are answered. Now, what is that answer? In that answer, very often we can we can read uh, best industry practices. And that's exactly what this group is doing. So wherever CDISC did not provide exact implementation guidance, which very often happens, right? Uh, what FUSE is trying to do is they're trying to formulate best industry practices. How do we all do it in an aligned way? And that's also where our collaboration comes from. That being said, what are we going to do at the workshop? It's not, of course, not only uh, going to talk about the SATM ADAM implementation work. Uh, we're going to start with an update, an update of what's new at CDISC. It's about a 20 minute update. Um, I'll talk about uh, the contents a little bit later. Um, and the workshop itself, the main content isn't really an extension as I already said, as from the ongoing project. The co-leads of that um, project right now is Bavin Lusa, uh, Kiran, Amy and Wendy Dobson as well. Yeah. 
So the workshop again agenda, we're going to start with the CD Squats new, about 20 minutes, and then we're going to organize breakout sessions. Yeah. So as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of work out there that's uh, currently being undertaken by this working group. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick out somewhere between four to six very specific implementation topics, and we're going to discuss it as a group. So we're going to break out in sessions, uh, basically to discuss what would be the best way forward, and what are our best implementation practices out there. Um, and we're going to write that down, right? In the meantime, at the end of that exercise, we're going to, uh, we're going to summarize yeah, all of our discussions. And towards the end of the session, we're going to discuss um, the results from the breakout session, right? So hopefully we have had some great discussions over there and we can take some of these results further. And hopefully we can also identify people that are interested to continue uh, working on this, yeah? Now in the intermediate between the breakout session and the readout, what we're going to do is we're going to give you an overview of the deliverables, past but also the coming deliverables of this team. Um, one of the things that we've identified out there is that these best practices, these FAQ answers out there, they, they are available on the Wiki website, but we have the feeling that not too many people out there have found their way exactly to those responses. So together with Fuse and CDSQ, we're trying to find a way to, um, to give this more attention, to, to make it more public, to, to have to expose uh, this, this good work to more people out there. And what we're trying to do in this, uh, this particular session is we're going to show you uh, the work what has been done in the past. We'll take it from there. How are we all going to organize our workshop? Um, of course, the attendees are expected to bring their laptops to the workshop. Um, discussion leads are assigned per discussion topic, right? So it depends a little bit about how many attendees we have and uh, how many topics we have to, um, to to talk about. But typically, we're assuming somewhere between four and six. And when we're going to break out in groups, we're going to assign discussion leads. Right? And discussion leads, of course, will take will take notes and will also do that uh, read back at the end of that session. Okay. The discussion topics, so on the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we can expect, but the actual discussion topics and also a little bit of their background, we're going to provide that as a pre-read to allow attendees to read up to the topic so that they can come prepared and that they can also, I would say, choose the topic for which they're most passionate about. Um, see this, what's new? Uh, what can we expect in that short session? Um, again, Amy and I will present on the current and upcoming development work by the foundational teams. So what has CDs been up to for the last year? Um, also, we are going to give you a first preview of a very exciting initiative that we're doing at CDISC, uh, the CDISC 2.0 pilot. That's a working title for the moment. And also other initiatives within CDISC, increasing clarity. Um, so. When you think about this entire collaboration between Fuse and CDISC, giving you that, giving our, our, our users more implementation advice, more help, that's also all about increasing clarity, making it easier for our end users. So we'll discuss that. What about the implementation topics itself? Um, I'm going to focus on, on, on some of the subtopics, uh, SETM and ADEM implementation guide nuances, validation and conformance rules, uh, particular questions around data submissions, legacy SETM mapping, trial design domains. Those are the five uh, topics on which most work has been done right now. But again, before the actual workshop, we're going to send out a pre-read um, to show you exactly what we're going to focus on. Yeah? So we realize that many, many people out there need help, need more guidance uh, with these uh, implementation topics. So we're going to be focusing on these mostly. And that's about it. So before I end, a very quick uh, ask for Amy. Amy, do you have anything to add? Other than that we're looking forward to the workshop? I put Amy on the spot a little bit. Maybe she's still on mute. Um, well, either way, Amy is not coming on, but uh, I can tell you that we are very much looking forward to the workshop and we're, we're looking forward to um, to do some good work, yeah. And with that, I uh, hand over to the next presenter. Hello, 
uh, this is Alan Brown. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you fine. Okay, great. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'd like to give a, a, an update um, as regarding a project that has been ongoing for several years with uh, the FDA Fuse uh, collaboration, uh, along with uh, a live demo of a, a software that we had uh, developed uh, out of this project, and then lead into a introduction of a new project, which we are uh, going forward with uh, starting this year. So uh, I'm sorry, I have this uh, material right in the middle of the slide set. Um, so over the last three years, uh, we've had a project uh, known as visualization of group-related differences in histopathology data, where we explored the use of various software applications for visually displaying pathology data from toxicology studies. And, and this is quite novel in that um, Pathology data is generated in, in data tables or tabulated summaries or text. And uh, we explored the use of, of a graphical output for displaying, you know, both descriptive but also hierarchical data. And during the course of this project, which lasted for three years, you know, we were very productive. We had three posters presented at FDA FUSE Computational Science Symposiums. Uh, we published a paper in regulatory toxicology and pharmacology, which was a cross-industry survey of the use of, of graphical tools. And then more recently, members of our project team, um, who are also part of the Society of Toxicologic Pathology, published a very nice paper on data visualization for pathology and clinical pathology, where they incorporated you know, a number of the material um, and learnings from our project team. What I'd like to introduce next is um, a dynamic tool for displaying and analyzing pathology data from single or multiple studies, which we have termed histographic. And this is a, quite a dynamic software tool. Uh, and therefore, I'm going to give a, a live demo of the tool. And, and what we've done as a proof of principle is we attained pathology data from 10 different studies for a single experimental compound. This was an anti-cancer agent, an mTOR C1, C2 inhibitor, in which the data were uh, donated and deposited into the IMI ETOX uh, database. And my colleague, Phil, Drew will give a update and introduction into ETOX and eTranssafe. But what we've done in essence is we have collated data from 10 different studies uh, with two different species uh, for a single compound. And what is depicted here are organs where there are findings in these organs and the area of the pi, in essence, is displaying uh, the frequency of findings or the incidence information. And so um, what's in the pi here are the most common target organs where listed here are, are organs with less common findings. And this is, an, uh, this is in a hierarchy where if we drill down further, what we can then move on to is the descriptive lesions for the different tissues. So as an example, if I was interested in exploring findings in the adrenal gland, I can simply click and what will be displayed here are the different types of lesions that were identified in the adrenal gland across these 10 different studies. By drilling down further, I can identify the, the animals in which these studies had the findings. Further down is a listing of the different studies for identification purposes, followed by the dose levels that these different findings were seen. 
the animal sex, either males or females. And um, when the tissues were collected, so as an example, if we were to look at vaculation of the zona glomerulosa, this was seen in rats, study one. These are the different dose levels, 12 or 18 milligrams per kilogram in both males and females, and uh, after 29 days. Now if I go back to um, the initial Uh, listing. Let's say, for instance, I wanted to search for a particular type of finding. Let's say I wanted to search for using the term atrophy. And what this does is it allows me to rapidly locate um, this description within the database, so cortical atrophy, adrenal gland. Similarly, I can type in a, a common pathology term, necrosis. And um, what this does is it identifies different tissues where necrosis is seen. So for instance, in the thymus, I can click on this, necrosis lymphocytes. In rats, these are the different studies that had this particular pathology finding. These are the dose levels right here. and the sexes and after the days. So what, what I've been able to do very rapidly is search across you know, a huge amount of information, um, both by terms and also by tissues to, to do an exploration using a, a dynamic graphical display tool that um, we, we find is quite easy to use. And so um, th this is what I wanted to, to present close out of here and go back to the slide presentation. So for um, 2018, um, you know, where we want to go now is, is we, we've closed out our, um, our project and we've uh, created a new project uh, where we want to use data visualization as an enabler for non-clinical safety signal detection. And, and the overall objective is to you know, further our you know, experience and interest in the realm of, of visualization, i.e. graphs, but also um, use this for identifying safety signals of concern within the scope of non-clinical data. And this can be enabled by using both algorithms and unique graphical displays. Um, within the clinical safety realm. This is more commonly done actually than with non-clinical. And so we want to look at what is being used or explored with clinical safety data and then see if we could uh, translate this to the non-clinical safety data. You know, our project will help to reinforce the utilization of standardized data, i.e. the SEND standard. And what will be key enablers of this project will be access to non-clinical data uh, from the IMI ETOX and eTranssafe consortiums. What we have experienced over the last several years is that it's actually very difficult to, to obtain data from you know, member companies or, or member pharmaceutical companies um, because of confidentiality issues. Um, but data that are present in the ETOX database is open. And, and can be used by um, our group, which is uh, going to be a key enabler. You know, as an example of um, of this, we can look at uh, clinical data analysis using the EDISH plots for identifying clinically relevant drug-induced hepatotoxicity, and EDISH stands for uh, evaluation of drug-induced serial serious hepatotoxicity. And this is really a, a simple graph in where clinical lab data, in this case serum ALT, uh, based on the upper limit of normal for an individual, is plotted simultaneously against serum bilirubin as a function of the upper limit of normal. And 
what is uh, postulated to be indicative of serious drug-induced liver injury is known as Hayes Law, and where the peak serum ALT is greater than three times upper limit of normal, so in this realm, at the same time that peak serum bilirubin is greater than two times upper limit of normal, so in this realm. So over in this um, graph, this is a, from a drug-treated trial. Uh, these data points up here are in the highest law area. And so they're indicative of uh, concern for drug-induced liver injury. While this is routinely done for clinical safety, um, we're not aware of a similar approach for non-clinical data. So as an example, uh, we can utilize the ETOX database to obtain clinical lab data and try graphing it out and then exploring to see whether or not this is related to a liver safety signal, as an example. So next, um, I'd like to um, have my colleague, Phil Drew, uh, present the ETOX database and how this will relate to our project. Phil, are you, um, are you available? Yes, I'm on the line. I just need to have the uh, control sent to me, which I may have. Do, do okay. You have yes, I have control. Everyone should see my screen now. Uh, well, thank you very much, Alan. I think that uh, th what you've uh, had to share with us is uh, extremely exciting. Of course, as a member of the, the team, I'm excited about it. But quite clearly, what's underpinning the uh, the, the, the possibility of our projects, uh, not only the one we've concluded, but our current one being successful, is access to uh, non-confidential data. Um, and as Alan pointed out, there's serious problem with trying to get such information d directly from pharma companies. But uh, initiatives such as ETOX uh, and the follow-on uh, consortium uh, project eTransafe, which I'll come on to in a moment, have opened the door to uh, data sharing in a really big way. Um, so I want to describe a little bit about this for you. So you are uh, brought up to speed with what's been going on in the EU uh, since 2010. Uh, the ETOX project uh, started in 2010. It was initially a five-year project. It ran for six years, in fact. Um, the consortium uh, developed a huge drug safety database from uh, legacy toxicology reports um, from public available toxicology data. It got the data from the reports uh, through um, uh, scanning uh, the a PDF, so it was uh, somewhat error prone, um, uh, which has been a, a, a small deterrent um, uh, in terms of the value of the data. Uh, of course, it's had to be uh, um, reworked to resolve that problem. Um, and uh, the other issue was that the over this period of time, the take up of, of donation, uh, which is a, a, an important part of those pharma companies signed up to the project, was uh, relatively slow and, and uh, tended to use very old um, compounds. Um, but nevertheless, a huge amount of information uh, uh, was assembled um, and uh, in silico strategies, uh, novel software tools were created uh, to better predict the toxicological profiles of small profile uh, of small molecules rather. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I've included in here some URLs so you can go and browse these uh, at your leisure to find out a little bit more about them. Uh, this is an IMI project, that's the Innovative Medicines Initiative, which is something that has been running uh, in the uh, EU for um, several years now, in fact, since 2010. Uh, and it's really devoted to large scale uh, sharing of data, which of course is why we were fortunate in being able to uh, avail ourselves of the uh, non-confidential data. Uh, and it undertakes data basing, mining of uh, industry legacy tox reports and uh, the predictive models, as I mentioned. It's a central tool for database querying and running of the predictive models is ETOXIS, which is available to the uh, members of the consortium. Uh, a very important deliverable from the project was uh, the Onto browser. In the absence of any controlled terminology for uh, histopathology uh, terms, uh, observational terms, the Onto browser was created. Uh, this is in 
this is still very important, even though I believe that CDISC is moving forwards with a uh, uh, with a controlled terminology for the uh, histopathology, uh, because uh, when we're dealing with data, real life data, uh, particularly uh, legacy data, there can be all sorts of uh, uh, of anomalies, uh, typos, a different use of language, etc., which the Onto browser is uh, used to ameliorate. Um, the Although you've already picked up on it, there was significant uh, collaboration from the EFPIA companies. This is the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations. Not all EFPI members uh, were uh, included in this particular project, um, but uh, a, a significant number were, uh, and a, a large number of those have carried forward to the new project. Now, a little bit more detail about uh, the sort of data that we have available to us, uh, there's over 8,000 non-confidential studies. So the, uh, and there's a, a lot of structures, uh, 1,464 different structures spread across these different species, different durations and administration routes. So you can see we've got a large pool of information to uh, access. Um, and just to give you a brief uh, insight uh, into the negative structures and positive structures to do with histopathology, uh, which of course is very relevant to our projects that you've just seen, uh, we can see the spread from those two uh, types. Uh, and these are all available in the ETOXDB, the database, which is accessed by ETOXSYS. Now, there's a follow-on project from the ETOX uh, called eTranSafe, um, which started last year. It's a five-year project uh, finishing in 20, uh, 2022. Um, and uh, the, the concept behind this is to uh, see what we can learn from the clinic uh, to inform the drug safety process to better um, align what we do uh, in that area, perhaps to uh, understand um, where a particular compound could have a, uh, an issue where we could stop the, the, uh, the safety study early, we could stop the compound early or whatever. So uh, essentially, the, we're picking up again on the main challenge uh, uh, of the uh, drug discovery development and submission process. Um, in particular, that we are keen to promote the sharing of public and private preclinical data. Um, of course, the sharing of private data is just within those firms that uh, donate, but, um, um, well, yes, and uh, what those data which we are considering to be um, non-confidential, and the public data are already in the public domain. Um, we're also very strongly aligned to the SEND uh, format, uh, although in order to build up our database, with what we anticipate to be somewhere in the region of 20,000 more studies, uh, we have to resort to legacy. When legacy has already been mentioned in this uh, presentation, uh, today rather, in earlier presentations as pro providing a challenge. That's a particular area that I'm uh, interested in. But the idea really is to provide an in-depth assessment of the preclinical species predictivity to human. So we're, it's this translational safety that we're interested in. So the challenge is to enhance the drug development process by the prediction of outcomes and in so doing, reduce the number of failed studies. And there is a very strong desire to reduce the use of the laboratory animals. Again, I've provided a, uh, a URL for you to investigate this at your leisure. So uh, this is the transition from ETOX to eTransafe. They are um, uh, connected in the sense that eTransafe is going to be able to access the data contained in the ETOX database as a seed, um, and, uh, but only for those uh, EFPIA members that uh, were in ETOX, ETOX that have now transitioned to eTransSafe. So you can see how that's building up strong uh, involvement with clinical, um, and uh, that presents its own interesting problems because the nature of the way in which data are explained or delivered in clinical are quite different to what we see in uh, preclinical. So uh, this is my last slide, so we should get in just in time. Uh, the aims of the TransSafe are to develop an internationally accepted guideline for data sharing. So we've already um, established that data sharing is possible, and I think our projects uh, are testament to that 
as we have a memorandum of understanding between uh, eTransafe, eTox and uh, uh, Fuse, uh, so that w the gateway is already open to uh, avail ourselves of non-confidential uh, non data. Um, it aims to accrue large sets of preclinical and high-level clinical safety data. Uh, it wants to conduct retrospective data analyses uh, to assess the, the translation, as I mentioned. Uh, so we're trying to see this linkage back into, uh, into the safety studies, uh, which are going to inform that, that process and, and prov provide better outcomes. Um, it, we want to ensure that participating companies have a similar or greater access to the data than the regulators. Now, this isn't trying to suggest that the regulators are being cut out, but it's, it's important that all the tools that are possibly available to the uh, donating to the submitting companies uh, to regul the regulatory authority have been able to um, review their data in as with as many tools as possible to give themselves the greatest possible confidence in submission and so that's one of the key objectives of the uh, of eTransafe. Uh, we also are interested in achieving regulatory readiness this is more of a push down uh, because uh, we're uh, encouraging firms to donate in SEND. Uh, this is for preclinical. Of course, there's uh, already an expectation that SEND is going to be out there, uh, but uh, there is a, a linking factor with, uh, with, with the expectations of the, the agency. And we want to develop innovative tools for data mining analysis, visualization, and predictive modeling. And this links very nicely into the project that Alan's just described uh, concerning the uh, safety signals that we see in the clinic. Um, and um, uh, which we can analyze through the literature, um, get best practice and so on, to see if we can apply those sorts of ideas into, uh, into preclinical. So uh, as far as our project is concerned, we are running closely in parallel with eTransafe, and in fact, we're dipping into their data as well. So we see it as a very collaborative thing. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Phil. Um, back to me, uh, that's Sascha Arvada, Fuse Communications uh, Director. Uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, thank you, to all of our speakers, for your excellent uh, presentations. Um, we haven't received any questions in the chat so far, and unfortunately, we are running out of time. Um, but we will, will post um, the recording of this uh, webinar onto uh, our Fuse website. Uh, so, and this will allow you, of course, also to post any questions. Um, directly uh, via YouTube. Um, so in case you have any questions, uh, feel free to post them in the comment section. Um, thanks to all the attendees um, and thanks to all the presenters again. Um, please block your time for the next webinar Wednesday, which will be October 24th um, this year. Okay, thank you everybody and have a great rest of the day. Bye.